Our second guest speaker in the Boardroom Insights Lecture Series is Mr. George Oliver, President of Tyco Safety Products and Electrical and Metal Products. Mr. Oliver's responsibilities include overseeing fire detection and fire suppression products, intrusion security, access control, electronic article surveillance, and video management systems. Before joining Tyco, Mr. Oliver served as president of GE Water and Process Technologies, a $2 billion sector of GE's business that included 7,000 employees worldwide. Prior to this, he was president of GE Engine Services with responsibility for the $5 billion global aircraft engine services business. Mr. Oliver is a graduate of Worcester Polytechnic Institute where he holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. He is married and has two children, one of whom, Michael, is a freshman here at Notre Dame. In his spare time, he enjoys golfing, water skiing, and hockey. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. George Oliver. Thank you. Am I on? Thanks, Ryan. And uh, good morning. It's, re it's really a pleasure to be here. And uh, what I thought I'd do today is uh, I've been asked to talk a little bit about the Tyco story because there's a lot of lessons learned there, uh, especially for business students. Talk a little bit about my career and as I've uh, grown within the business community over the last 26 years. And then uh, really want to open it up for any questions that you might have relative to my experience or, or to Tyco. Now, I also looked at your itinerary, and I understand that you have had Herb Kelleher a couple of weeks ago. And I know Herb very well, having that, that Herb was one of my largest customers when I ran the GE Engine Services business. I'll try to make it as fun as I'm sure Herb did, uh, you know, and make it an interactive session. And as Sam said, uh, certainly would like to entertain your questions along the way uh, as I go through my presentation. So on that, we'll talk about the Tyco story, my career, and some views on leadership. And I think as you all embark on your careers, what I think really will make a difference uh, going forward. Just a little bit about Tyco. Tyco is a, a global con conglomerate. Uh, today we have about 118,000 employees globally. Uh, we're about $18 billion. This is last year's numbers, about $18 billion in revenue. And, and, and certainly a proud and very interesting history, and I'll share some of that with you today. The five business units, when you go on and see what our reported earnings are on a quarterly basis, we have five business units. The largest business unit is ADT Worldwide. It's a security services business. It's about $7.5 billion in revenue. The, one of the, the segments that I lead is Tyco Safety Products. On, a, on an external reported basis, we have about $2 billion in revenue. And we also produce about $1.5 billion of product that we serve to both the ADT Worldwide Securities business, as well as fire detection product that we serve to the, the fire protection services. The electrical and metals products business is about a $2.5 billion business. It's a metals business where we take hot and cold rolled steel. We convert that into tubular product. Uh, and again, that's very cyclical with the commodity that we convert. The fire protection services business is about a $3, $3.5 .3 billion segment. It's a worldwide business where we provide uh, electronic fire detection as well as services that are associated with that protection uh, in about every end market that requires those products. And flow controls is about a $4 billion segment, which is a lot of automation and controls. The end market's mainly oil and gas and, and, and water infrastructure type projects. When you look at our revenue today, you can see the breakdown. Uh, this was at last year, again, $18.6 billion. The good news here is our, our whole agenda going forward from, from the separation that occurred last year into three publicly traded companies was really our, our agenda was growth, being able to outperform within this, the segments that we compete in, as, as I discussed. And, you know, you might not recognize Tyco always within uh, each one of the industries that we compete, but we have very strong brands within each one of those segments that I think you might recognize. Within the security segment, it's ADT or the Sensomatic brand that you might see within a retail space. In fire protection services, especially within North America, it's Simplex Grinnell. Uh, worldwide, it's Wormald. In flow control, you might be familiar, uh, especially in Europe, Keystone, Vanessa are the key brands that we compete with. And in safety products, it's the Scott fire products that we provide, which is the self-contained breathing apparatus that we provide to emergency responders, or Grinnell or Ancel within the suppression world. 
And then in the electrical and metals products business, our largest business is in south of Chicago and Harvey, and it's mainly the Allied Tube and Conduit brand. A little bit about the leadership team. Ed Breen came into the company back in 2002, and I'm going to give you a little bit of that story and the turnaround that he has led over the last six years. I came into the company about two years ago as part of the, the separation into three publicly traded companies. I lead two of the, the five reported segments that I shared with you, which is safety products and electrical and metals products. Externally, that equated last year to about $3.8 billion. This year will be well over $4 billion externally reported, as well as, as I said, I produce product that serves the other business segments. So there's four operating presidents. I'm one of the four working directly for our chairman and CEO, Ed Breen. Now, the, the significance of, of the discussion today is, is really what we embarked on, and this goes back about three, three years ago, into separating the company. That there was a view, once the company stabilized uh, after Ed Breen came in, the thought was that with the diversity of the portfolio that we had, that it was in the best interest to our shareholders to really separate into three separately traded companies to really be able to focus on a particular vertical and be able to grow within that vertical and have the capital required to continue to, to accelerate growth within those verticals. So at that time, we launched upon separating the company into three key segments, which is Tyco Electronics, which, which is a separately traded company today, Covidian, which is the healthcare segment uh, headquartered up in Massachusetts. Uh, both of those segments are about $10 billion in revenue. And then the remaining portfolio was Tyco International, which is what I just summarized uh, previously. And when you look at this separation, it was a long road. When you, when you think of, of the company, it was a pure holding company. And I think the amazement of what Tyco, how Tyco was built, it was built on, on eight, it was 809 companies bought from, from 1999 to 2002, uh, over, over 1,000 uh, companies, which when you think of the complexity that that presented within each one of these segments is pretty unbelievable. There was really no unified identity, and today we still struggle a little bit about that with that within each one of the segments that we compete in. There was really, it was a holding company without a lot of um, standard discipline from an operating standpoint across each one of the segments. Massive debt load, and that was the first crisis that, that Ed Breen had to face when he came in as the new chairman in, in 2002. And when you looked at what happened to the stock price back in 2001, one about $60, and then in September of 2002, we're down as low as $7. And we had a lot of people that, you know, that, that ultimately were counting on the company uh, in, in positioning the company for success going forward. We had 220,000 employees in more than 60, 60 countries. So when you think about the complexity that was created by the acquisition spree that, that Kozlowski and company were on, you can imagine what, what that meant now to this company in trying to reposition and go forward. So the key events, you know, when, when you go back to that story, back in January of 2002, prior to the Ed Breen regime, it, it was disclosed that we were going to split up the company. And then you know, a couple months later, we abandoned that plan to split up the company. In June, that's when the previous CEO, Dennis Kozlowski, was indicted and resigns. And then in July is when Ed Breen came on as the new chairman and CEO. And he was, his experience was the coming out of this being the COO with Motorola and ultimately became the chairman and CEO of Tyco. And when you, then, then that led into a lot of investigations and a lot of corporate governance issues that needed to be addressed. And so when you think about how bad was all of that and you put it in perspective, liquidity crisis. It was $11 billion in debt on maturing in 2003 that Ed had to deal with uh, and we're living day to day uh, to make sure we can continue to be able to run the companies. Uh, the leadership, right, that when, they, when they took over, realized that there was a significant leadership challenge uh, to be able to reposition the company for the future. And at the, at the top, they started right from the top. 290 of the top 300 leaders were fired or replaced, which is pretty significant. So it was pretty much a, a clean slate in starting over with the company. The board transition, you know, interesting when you... You know, you get out one-on-one -on -one with Ed and you talk about what he was thinking and what he was experiencing during these times. And at the end of the day, that, that, that you know, when, when he came on board, he was hired by a board that he had a fire to ultimately reposition the company. It's pretty significant and, and certainly a big, big aspect of the success that the turnaround uh, has had. And then when you think about the stock price, you know, we had total shareholder dissatisfaction and, and out 
total outrage, you know, from our, our shareholder base. And most important, it was the employees. You know, a lot of the employees were alienated, uh, confused, a lot of distrust of the senior leaders, a lot of fear of what the future might hold. And I think, you know, just my, my learning over the last two years, having had 24 years within GE, and then able to, to now come in as part of a turnaround within Tyco, I can tell you it was built because we, we did, although we might have paid premium for a lot of good businesses, we had a good set of businesses, and we had very competent people. We had a lot of depth and people within the businesses, and what, what really needed to be done was exactly what Ed set out to do, was really replace the top leadership, get the fundamentals back within the businesses, get the employee trust back within the, the, the entire organization, and ultimately put together a plan that people could buy into and lead forward with. When you think about the reputation, this is an interesting chart, because I think all of you can, can uh, are somewhat uh, affiliated with or, or at least have some sense of some of these these disasters here and what the, the reputation uh, happened to these companies. And you can see Tyco, even compared to three other big corporate uh, disasters or, or issues that were out there, we had a very low favorability rating. Uh, so we had a huge, or Ed had a huge task in front of him in being able to turn that reputation around. And Ed, you know, th this, in getting to know and, and, and work with Ed over the last couple of years, it really, this has been what his theme has been. It's been about the people, it's been about culture, it's been about values. And when he thinks of, when he came into the company, it was humility, service, and lifting the human spirit, uh, work as well in the boardroom as they do in the classroom. And I think it was really a polar opposite of, of the former CEO, uh, Kozlo, you know, Koz, Dennis Kozlowski. And what he did was immediately re-engage. So totally get connected down through the organization with all of the employees. So visited, you know, not every country where we do business, but many of the countries that we do business uh, within the first two years. Held town hall meetings with, with uh, groups of employees talking about the company, talking about the strengths of the companies. You know, in every business that we're in, we're number one or two. We've got great businesses. And the ability not to now position, reposition those businesses for growth going forward was a huge opportunity. And really reached out, you know, although it's tough to, to be able to connect directly with, with over 200,000 employees, was able to connect with over 35,000 employees directly to really get the confidence back within the companies to get everyone helping to lead the company forward. And I think the, the, the single biggest aspect, um, especially from the senior level, is really instilling values. And so Ed has been, over, over the last six years, it's really been about four fundamental values. And the foundation is integrity, which ultimately is what we expect out of all of our employees with how we compete and how we run our businesses globally. And then the, the key elements tied to that foundation is teamwork, accountability, and excellence in everything we do. And no matter where you go today, no matter what business that you go and visit or talk with employees with, they'll understand the values and ultimately what the mission is here with those values going forward. And so that's, it's important for all of us as being part of the senior leadership team to really set that tone from the top. And the simplicity of this chart is really making sure that the message, the importance of, of ethics, integrity, and compliance is perfectly clear with all of our employees. And that we want to engage with issues, we want to fix issues, and ultimately set the business such that going forward we're going to be totally compliant. And so the agenda, when, when I think about the Tyco agenda today, it's pretty simple. You know, we've, we've addressed a lot of the corporate governance issues um, and really now are focused on the future, which is really growth and growth organically, as well as making selective strategic acquisitions to accelerate that growth. And the second part is being operationally excellent with everything we do across the business fundamentals. And so I won't go through each one of these, but these are some of the things that now, as a separated company, that we're focused on to create more value for our shareholders. So ADT North America, you know, adding residential uh, customers through increased internal account generation. You know, Resto World is really looking to how do we take the strength that we have within our North American business and position that in the higher growth emerging markets to accelerate growth. In safety products, where we're more of a product company, how do we accelerate our R&D investments to assure that we have the right products to be able to compete in the higher growth emerging markets and take the lever leverage the strengths that we have within the core businesses globally to have that technology leadership. 
In flow control, it's, it's really about taking huge amount of strength that they have within some, some key end markets, making strategic acquisitions, and making sure, again, that we're taking that strength and we're positioning it globally. And then in the, the uh, fire business, Simplex Grinnell, a big element of service. We've got a huge install base with our products within the, the, the fire detection space. How do we leverage that install base, create services for our customers that accelerate our revenues while we're increasing the value to the, the, the customers we're serving? And then in our temp business, we're very much North American-based. And, and what are we doing now to leverage the, the strengths that we have within our North American business and position that within the higher growth emerging markets? And so I think when I think about the Tyco story, when, you know, in summary, was really a total turnaround coming in, with, starting at the top. New CEO back in 2002, building the foundation for the future with a set of businesses that were very strong within their individual space, and really now uh, operationalizing that with stronger leadership, expanding the core, and then ultimately refocusing now on growth and fueling that growth through cost out, better pricing, and business simplification across a number of these businesses that were never integrated. And so what, what I wanted to do is then share with you kind of my story and my progression through uh, business over the last 26 years, uh, because I think it also, in line with some of the experiences I've had, I think would spark some discussions that you might have or questions you might have. I started out as an engineer, and so I, I went to engineering school, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. I earned a mechanical engineering degree, and at the time was very much interested in getting into, uh, GE was into aircraft engines. There was a large operation within Massachusetts where I grew up and was interested in going to work there. And very quickly I realized that I wasn't an engineer's engineer. I wasn't into necessarily designing that next generation engine. I wanted to leverage the training that I had within engineering to really apply it more in business. And very quickly got into the operations. So I, I applied that in a manufacturing environment. I led a number of manufacturing facilities uh, in, in a lot of different aspects of manufacturing. So it could be around materials management. It could be around being a supervisor on the shop floor. A lot of different experiences that allowed me to learn how to lead people and really take the lessons that I learned in engineering school and apply it in a, in a real-time sense within business. And very quickly from there, I was able to progress, if you looked at my career, through various levels of operations up to and including leading fairly large manufacturing sites. And I think the most significant uh, change here was as I was uh, advancing pretty rapidly based on the leadership development that I had within operations, about the 1995 time period, you see where I went to appliances. Well, I happened to be part of the most interesting, most exciting business in aircraft engine. It played to my strengths. I was an engineer, and that was going to be my life. And at the time, I, I had... Obviously, you got, got a view from, from at the time that the CEO and chairman, Jack Welsh, said, well, if, if, if he's that good in operations in aircraft engines, let's test him in a short cycle business in, in refrigeration, which are appliances, refrigeration, and see how that leadership is applied in a whole different environment. That was a huge transformation for me personally because I, I left my comfort zone being in a long cycle, highly engineered product business and then having to go into appliances where every day you're fighting for what changed yesterday and making sure that you, from an operational standpoint, you're quickly adapting to the market changes, to the customer changes. And ultimately, I tell people that every year you start out almost back to, to, to zero. And every year, your ability to generate profit is your ability to take cost out, add features, and not get any price for the product that you're ultimately serving to the customer. And it was a, it was a great opportunity. And that's what led me to be able to go back to aircraft engines. And what I was able to do within appliances said that, well, okay, if he can do that in appliances, let's get him to go back to a long cycle business where he's very comfortable and drive the same amount of change that you can drive in a short cycle business. So I got my dream job. At that time, I went back to aircraft engines. I became a vice president, led all of the component design and manufacture of all the aircraft engines, including up to the assembly and test of all of the engines that we produce for the military as well as uh, all the commercial customers. And it was the easiest two years of my career. So if I hadn't got out of my comfort zone, learned to really adapt in a whole new environment, bring those strengths back and, uh, and reapply them in an area that I had a terrific amount of depth because of my previous career, was definitely a game changer for me. 
And from there, it led to new opportunities. So after I did that assignment for two years, and at that time was working for uh, Jim McNerney. So the other, the other theme on this career progression is I worked for great leaders. And so leaders, great leaders develop great leaders. And so you always want to search out the type of leader that you work for. And those type of leaders, you'll learn a ton from. They will challenge you, and they will mentor you, and they'll ultimately position you for your next big assignment. So I was able to work for, for Jim McNerney at the time. We were building a big services company within aircraft engines. And they were, they were undergoing a lot of change, a lot of operations challenges that ultimately played to my strengths. Now, I'm not quite sure if that had not been occurring at the time would I had that opportunity to jump over to a P&L. So I went from being an operations leader to now a P&L leader, leading a $5 billion P&L, leading the GE aircraft engine services business. And then from there, it has, has enabled me to take on new challenges. So from there, after a couple of years, was, was put into the new space. GE's building a new platform within, within water. Uh, it really initially was around doing a, a number of acquisitions to build out that portfolio. And then uh, most recently, when I was looking to make a change in the excitement that was taking place within Tyco during the separation, um, this was a great opportunity for me to embark on and, and become part of Ed's team with the change that was occurring here and really position a great set of businesses uh, for the future. So that's kind of my, my career. And my thoughts on that, and I share this because I think nine times out of ten, and, and I was trained during my career that the most important thing you do uh, as a leader is develop people. And, you know, there was always a thought that, you know, a majority of time, one way or another, should be tied to developing people through the business process as well as personal engagement with individuals. And I tell people that when I look back across my GE experience as well as the two years I've been within Tyco, it really comes down to two elements. Being good at what you do and creating depth, and, it, and that can be within a function, that can be within finance, that can be within operations, that can be within technology, and really make a difference with the depth that you create within that element. And at the same time, demonstrate that because of that depth, you can drive change. You can try, drive change within the business, you can improve fundamentals, and you ultimately become a leader of change. And many, many times we use different programs to, to cultivate the, the change element. It can be a Six Sigma program where people will then get out of their comfort zone in, in a function, become a Six Sigma leader, which ultimately helps drive process discipline across some of the business fundamentals. And by doing so, you get recognized as not only having depth, but the ability to drive change, and then being someone that embraces the values of the companies that you work for. And then the combination of such really positions you to be able to accelerate your careers and being able to take on additional responsibilities and have a bigger, bigger difference across the company. And so I think about it. People, I do a lot of mentoring and, and, and talking with individuals, and, you know, there's, there's some fundamentals. I think on the left here, you'll see, you know, these are basic. You've got to have integrity across, you know, all of the companies today. You lead with integrity. You have to have a reputation, or build a reputation of execution. You want to be viewed as a go-to person that when you commit to go do something, you do it. And nine times out of ten, it happens. You obviously want to demonstrate business acumen. You want to be viewed as someone that can drive change because change is what adapts to the changes happening globally across our set of businesses. Obviously, you have to be intelligent. And Six Sigma, for me, becomes a differentiator because that demonstrates that that is an enabler to, to driving change. And you know, over the right, I won't go through the right, but I think when I look at people, a lot of times people have everything on the left to some degree. They don't always accelerate it with what I call the differenti differentiators on the right. And so these are the things that pull people, as Welsh used to always say, pull people out of the pile, that you know, everyone's pretty good but the ones that really, really get noticed and get recognized are the ones that, that do the things that are on the right. And acceleration is really, the, uh, I get asked a lot, well, what, what else can I do? What else can I do? How do I position? And I always tell people that at the end of the day, you always want to take on the biggest job that you believe that you can take on, or even jobs that, that maybe you view are bigger than yourself that ultimately leaders have enough confidence in being able to, to give you those challenges. You want to be able to work for good leaders and understand a big part of their job is developing you, 
Because that's how you're going to grow and ultimately be part of their, their success going forward. And when I think of some of the key elements of that is, is vi- early exposure, getting visibility as early as you can. And, and that, again, gets back to making sure you get challenges or, or opportunities where you can make a difference and not just be a staffer or someone that's in the back room, but someone that ultimately is making a difference and really improving the fundamentals of the business and, and building the business going forward. It's taking tough jobs. One of the things I, I tell people, you know, I never really had an interview for a job, and part of it is built on reputation. You take on a challenge, you, you make something significant happen, you execute, you, get, you, you, you build a reputation for execution, and what happens is the next big opportunity comes to you. And so, because at the end of the day, there's never enough talent Right? You've you got to view from my, my, from my vantage point or any top, top leader's vantage point, there's never enough talent in the organization. And so as you're looking to structure organizations, promote people, and look to enhance the organizational capability, you're always looking to pull people, to pull people up and give them bigger assignments. And so the way that that happens is you get exposed to these people. You get exposed to the CEO. You get exposed to the top leaders within the business. And that, that is what generates sponsors. And sponsors want to help and find ways to get people moved and, and give them bigger assignments. So take tough job, get early exposure. Global assignments are a big deal. You know, most of our growth as we look forward will become, come out of the global emerging markets. Anytime you get an opportunity, and I tell people, especially early in your careers, you get a global opportunity, take it. It, it is a differentiator. Um, as the companies struggle to grow globally, I think it, it does help develop leaders that ultimately can bring the company forward. Uh, depth, as I talked about, having functional depth, product depth, I- industry depth, because that ultimately is what drives change. If you're good at what you do, then you fundamentally can help drive change with the depth that you bring. And then breath, breath is, you know, we have a view that don't always stay into your comfort zone. And so once you develop depth, be able to reach beyond that and get experiences, whether it be in another function, another business, uh, whatever it may be that ultimately creates breath. And then the idea, we've all failed. And I think sometimes the, the most important thing is recognizing failure. And then understanding, you know, part of the learning process is what, what led to that failure such that you can modify behavior or change uh, your leadership to assure that going forward you learn from that failure and, and reapply what's going to drive success. And then when I think about, you know, I've seen so many smart people out of the best business schools, out of the best universities come in, come in and you think about why weren't they successful? You know, when you think about what was their biggest element of, of not growing, not being able to get the better opportunities, the bigger opportunities, or ultimately the long-term uh, you know, future within the company. And it really comes down to two, two that are a non-starter, a lack of integrity or lack of execution. That, that to me, that's where it immediately is, is a non-starter. But the softer elements that, that cause people not to be able to, to be successful is they don't understand how to leverage peer relationships. I don't care what company you're in, being able to leverage peer relationships and, and being a team player. It's okay that you can bring you know, a lot of strength yourself, but you've got to leverage that across your peers and across the teams that you, you participate in. A lot of times we tend to promote people too quickly and they don't have the, the experience maturity uh, in being able to really uh, operate from an executive standpoint within the positions they're in. Um, and people that can't ex- execute through others, you know, where the, that most of what they do is individual and they can't lead and being able to apply that across teams uh, that, that contribute to their success. And the personal impact, part of this is, is, is pretty, we used to call it E-cubed in, in, in GE, but, but having energy, having passion, being able to execute, and really fundamentally your presence having an impact on the environment that you work within that brings other people along. And then it stops growing. The biggest thing that, that we do and all leaders do, and, and, and I think we're here today, is learning. Learning is a lifelong experience. And I think those that understand that getting feedback, making modifications to behavior, changing leadership style, understanding new generations is a constant process. 
And those that, that continue to try to change along with the changing environment are going to be able to stay fresh. Those that don't, they fall behind. And so I've seen many of my peers fall behind because they tend to stop growing, they don't ultimately stay fresh with the current environment that we're competing in and therefore find themselves left behind. And then the last is, you know, we have a lot of people that are very bright, but when the ego gets in the way, um, you know, and try, tries to get it, get it done alone, they typically fail because they don't get the organizational support, they don't get the support from their team members, and ultimately they fail. And so those are some of the thoughts on, on maybe my, from my vantage point over my career, what really has impacted uh, a lot of people not being able to, to grow within their companies. So on that, what I thought I'd do is open it up for any questions. I obviously was provoking around the whole Tyco story, you know, my experience, as well as some of the, my thoughts around leadership, and as you all embark on your careers, some thoughts that I thought I'd share with you. So questions. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that the importance of working with good leaders, and I'm interested to know if you were ever in a situation where you were working under a person that you didn't perceive as a good leader, and how did you handle that? You know, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's one of these things, and, and I can tell you I've had some success and I've had some failure with that, um, but for the most part I've worked for great leaders. Um, and what you need to do is you obviously need to continue to, I think you build a reputation, you build a network that you've got to keep fresh, right? And when you get yourself working for someone that ultimately maybe might not be the leader um, that you would want to be working for, you've got to ob obviously, you've got to be professional, you've got to you know, work, and you've got to follow that leader, but at the same time you've got to maintain you know, the other relationships that are critical to your success within a company. And I think that's a balance. You know, that's one of the things that you need to balance. There's no one answer. What I do tell people is that, especially at the lower levels, I think the higher you go, the more difficult it is to make change. But at the lower levels, when you're not working for a good leader, especially early in your career, I, I get out. <laughs> because I've seen a lot of folks, a lot of people that have come into companies, really talented, great leaders, have got stuck working for what I'd call mediocre managers, that are, that are managers and not leaders, and they tend to hold people down. Their success is personal for them, not, not their, their, their folks, and, and they'll spend three, four, five years and find themselves left behind. And so early in your career, I, I, you know, we go through on an annual basis, and, and we did this in GE and we do it in Tyco, you have an annual review. And it's a forcing function to assure that you're getting feedback from your leader relative to your leadership development and, and progression, as well as it's your opportunity to put, put back pressure back on the organization, understanding what you want to achieve and getting the support that you need to make those moves and get the training required to achieve your, your ultimate goals. So that's a forcing function. And, and make sure that that process is utilized and pushed back. And what I find is over time, you become, I have, you know, Many, many folks that I t today mentor, they might not necessarily work for me today, they might not even work in the same company, but, but we've built relationships such that when they're embarking on a change, a career change, or looking at a new opportunity, or having trouble with a, a boss they might be working for, they reach out and call me. So today I, I will spend, on, on a given week, I will probably reconnect with, with three or four past acquaintances that we had built a relationship and provide some of that mentoring and coaching. So I don't think there's any one answer to your question. I think it's something that you've got to utilize the processes that are in place. Make sure that, that you, your views are, are recognized. And, and the earlier in the career, the more you want to push that envelope. Because I think then the, the damage is less. The higher you go, the more difficult it becomes. Right? But, but there are processes in place that address that also. You mentioned in your talk uh, a great deal about integrity being one of the characteristics that you must have. Uh, can you give an example of uh, a time in your career when you had an integrity challenge and how you handled it? Oh, this, uh, you know, one of the things you'll find in business, every day, every day you're forced with a decision that is, is a, you know, it's an integrity question. Every day. And so I don't care where you are. 
And the, is most immediately, you've got to demonstrate that there's never a gray area and that you, you establish a culture that no matter what the implication is, you're going to do what's right. And when people think there's a head fake and think that maybe you know, there is some question, that's when your organization gets in trouble. And so when, when I was in, you know, personally, I mean, I, I could give you a number of, of, of cases, but in general, in aircraft engines, obviously with the nature of the product that we produce, um, you, you know, you, you get things that at the end of the day, you know, it could be questionable and you find you, yourself having to, to ultimately make decisions on the spot that immediately get the resources to address it appropriately. And it can be around, you know, in that world it was more around compliance, quality, um, and, and the product. In, in, in my new world, it's, it's more, more around, you know, compliance, you know, especially with the, like, for instance, the uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, you know, when you think about how we compete globally. But I think what, what I have found is all, at times when you're making those decisions, there's definitely potentially financial implications. There's many other things that might force you to, to not want to make that decision. And what I have found is very quickly, and that's what Ed Breen did when he came into Tyco, very quickly realized that we're going to do things right. We're going to establish a standard. We're going to, we're going to obviously have to deal with the implications of that. Um, and I think it, what it does, it, it forces employees to proactively understand what they're doing, serve up issues that they're not quite sure about, and then the organization reacting to be able to fix processes to be fully compliant with how we conduct business around the globe. And I think, you know, I'm trying to think of a personal example, but there's been many where you get into a situation where you have to make those tough decisions. Uh, Mr. Oliver, you worked at uh, GE Water, which I know um, is a really dynamic uh, business within GE's portfolio right now, uh, involved in a lot of emerging markets and a uh, really uh, dynamic uh, part of the portfolio. And you came there from GE Aircraft, which I know is a huge revenue generator, but has been around for quite a long time. Was there any, was it difficult tr um, switching like mindsets from, from different businesses, going from one business to another, and uh, what were some of those challenges oh, involved? Oh, it's, it's huge. You know, when you think about culture, the environment you work in, and many times, uh, especially within a, a company like GE, you take for granted the existing culture and the values in the company. When the new platforms are being built and they're being built on acquisition, you're acquiring a lot of other cultures and a lot of other environments. And unless you have a good integration process in being able to bring those cultures together to seize the best, out of the businesses and ultimately align with the, the corporate culture, um, I can tell you that within an established, you know, long cycle business that had been part of the GE portfolio for a long time, that is, you know, ingrained and it makes things easier. When you get into these new environments, it really does require a whole different level of leadership to bring along cultures and values where ultimately through acquisition, and you can imagine with the number of acquisitions that Tyco made, why it led to what we had to do, you know, as far as the separation of the companies. We, we never really had integrated the companies within these segments. Therefore, we had a lot of disparate processes. We had companies competing totally differently. We had, we had multiple cultures. We didn't have one set of values. And so when I think about the experience within those two, and if, if, if I think about the biggest challenge I had going from aircraft engines you know, to, to water was that, was the establishing the, the culture, the environment, the values, the operating uh, rhythms that are required to be successful within a company like GE. Um, and that, that's tough because when you think about, I tell people the most important element of business uh, or the success of business is people. And so we always fight for getting the best to come in the front door at the entry level, being able to create a huge amount of runway for their growth. So you want, to, you want people that are smart, that have energy, that have a lot of leadership to come in, and you want to give them every opportunity to stretch uh, within the culture. And, and over time, when you do that, you create a culture. And it's a culture around people, it's around the values, and it's around growth. And think about what we had within Tyco. 
And I can tell you, even to this day, even in, in my, my businesses, we're still integrating. We're still integrating the businesses so that we do have one culture. We do have one set of business processes. And we do have one fundamental you know, focus on people development as being the key enabler of our success. And so that's the focus on getting the best, stretching the best, and wanting those people to be totally successful in being able to grow within the company. And I think that's the challenge of any business today, especially in the environments, you know, as we speak here, right? I'm, I'm not quite sure what's happening to the market today, but, you know, the, what's happening in the market and what that ultimately is going to, the impact that that's going to have on business is going to be, you know, many, many business cases will come out of that, right, going forward. You've been responsible for a very diverse portfolio, um, and you have global operations. Um, what are some of the techniques and strategies you use to move into new markets if you see room for expansion? Obviously, you had the turn, or the company Tyco at least has turned around from to, to become profitable and um, pay off debt. And to expand on what you just spoke about, um, what are some of the concrete goals that you have for? breaking down the barriers between your different um, businesses to better serve those customers around the globe? That's uh, two great questions. The, there's always, a, you know, I, I tend to, to, you always want to be someone viewed as on the edge, right? So you want to be someone that's kind of viewed on driving change, on the edge, um, and, and ultimately that's how you make a difference. And so when I think about, let me just go back to the previous question because I, I think I can reflect on probably Herb's discussion back with Southwest. When you build a company, you build a company on a culture or a personality. And I can tell you firsthand that everything that Herb might have shared with you is true. Because having Southwest as my largest customer when I ran engine services, and you go spend a day at the headquarters in Southwest, you feel Herb. You feel Herb's personality. You feel his fun-loving. You feel his mix-it-up. You walk the aisles, and it's all about people. It's all about culture. It's all about giving back. It's about the Ronald McDonald House. It's about all the things that they like to do and, and really have fun around that ultimately makes them a, a better uh, corporate citizen. And so when you think about what we're doing at Tyco, the personality of the company is Ed's. And it's Ed, Ed is, is you know, very down to earth. He's very personable. He's engaging with employees. He, set, he has set a very informal atmosphere for people to, in, you know, to, to engage one another. And ultimately, the foundation has been integrity. And when I get into the forcing function on the, the emerging markets, global markets, I'll give you an experience where I do have a diverse set of businesses. So within, within safety products, I have three platforms. So I have the, the, uh, the leading world suppression company, which is a... a, a it's, it's made up of water suppression and chemical suppression. So we, we produce with the industry leader of sprinkler heads to designing you know, very complex, highly engineered suppression systems for a refinery. And we're the industry leader, roughly about $1.4 uh, $1 billion. The second is electronic security. So electronic security is, is anything from the electronic fire detection that you might have in a building like this uh, to including access control security or even video or video surveillance security. Uh, so that's within that portfolio. And then the last is what we call the life safety or breathing business, which is, you, I think you're familiar with the Scott product, which is the self-contained breathing apparatus that we provide to firefighters and, and emergency responders. So think about the, just the, the diversity in that business. And then the other business I have is I, I buy about a million tons of steel, hot and cold rolled steel, and I convert it to being anything from electrical conduit up to and including anything up to about eight, eight inch in di diameter uh, piping and tubing. And it can be electrical conduit, it can be fence, it can be sprinkler pipe, it can be you know, uh, a, a lot of different products as, as, as an end market that we support. So when you think about the diversity, I'm constantly working now, how do I leverage strengths across the businesses to, to, to eliminate any duplication. And especially as we think about globally, how do you create a footprint that allows you to be better and you can move faster to be able to capitalize on the emerging market? So the example that I'll give you was that we were not doing a good job 
although we're the industry leader within each one of these segments um, that, I, that I just explained, we were not doing a good job in developing, taking the core technology and developing products so that we can localize. You know, we have local products in the emerging markets. And we were, you know, we were very North American centric. You know, we, you know, it's the approach of we're the best, we'll bring the best to the emerging markets, they'll buy. Well, that doesn't happen, right? Because the emerging markets is a different market. And they're, they're less developed and they're developing. So you've got to always find ways to then take your core technology and position it such that you can establish, you know, a footprint in the emerging markets. You've got to make some money and then be able to accelerate. And so all of our businesses were looking at it incrementally. And I got to the point last year, total, you know, the, the, the pace of change, our ability to really position within the markets was too slow. So what we did was I, oh, I committed at, at the headquarters level, you know, to build a, a center of excellence. So I, in a year, we've put a, 100 engineers in, in China, which we call a center of excellence, and there's multiple disciplines. So there's electronic security discipline, there's fire suppression, there's uh, life, life safety or, or breathing technology. And then uh, we're doing the same thing in India. And it's a forcing function such that, okay, we're going to establish a center. I will bear the, the expense for the first year of how I go out in the market and get the best talent, bring those talents into the company, and position then for the second operating year to make that part of the businesses. And that's what we've done this year. And it has immediately accelerated our ability to be able to develop the right products and be able to enter those markets successfully to be able to position for a much you know, greater growth uh, going forward. And I think that's an example where, and then the other element, you cannot lead from the corner office. That I, I showed you a little bit about what Ed did when he took over the company, but you gotta get out in the field. So I spend better than 50% of my time in the field. There's nothing, you, you cannot, as smart as people are, and as, as you know, you, you have a lot of operating reviews, which keeps a pretty good pulse on your businesses, you gotta get out with people. And so I spend, you know, I'll go to Asia twice a year for, for two weeks straight, you know, Europe on a, on a, on a bi-monthly basis. And that's how you learn. You learn about the cultures. You learn about how we do business. And then you work with the local teams to make sure they're getting the resources to be successful. And, you know, those are a couple of things that I've done over the last couple of years. Uh, when you first started your presentation, you put up a pie chart with uh, $18 billion of revenue. Uh, you're in a unique position that you actually uh, manage both uh, what I'll call the national market, the U.S. market, and the international. Uh, can you describe any of the differences between making what I'll call an international decision as opposed to a national decision? It, it relative to any one of the businesses? Relative to any one of your businesses, yes. I mean, let, let's face it, there's, there's differences within each one of these business models with how we, com we compete, you know, both within the, the uh, U.S. as well as global. Um, you know, a lot of our businesses are driven by regulation, and so we're, we're constantly trying to drive, um, and, and I'll, t I'll give you an example in the residential suppression, in, in the suppression business, we've been driving code in, into the residential space. Um, <clears throat> just recently, over the last three years now, and the data suggests that we've saved a, a lot of lives, and a lot of lives can be saved by, um, by getting residentials as part of code in new, new construction. And so that's something that we've led as a business uh, over the last three years and just recently have been successful in getting that, that uh, approval. Globally, we do the same, especially as we look to improve standards globally with how we compete, is getting the standards such that, number one, it plays to our strengths, but, but with what we do, we make a difference in the industries we compete. And so how we manage those businesses in the investment levels, um, in, in the new product development, in the creating a footprint with the right sales and marketing teams um, is aligned to, to those standards that we generate within the business. So what happens is we, we tend to, um, we have global councils where we actually have, you know, we, we, we run a set of businesses, but within those businesses we have regional leads that have a lot of decision making with how we deploy our businesses, you know, within those regions. Another question? 
You mentioned earlier uh, about the recent struggles in the financial market. How has that affected Tyco? I mean, directly. I mean, that's everyone asks every day, and, and we're in. You know, it's interesting. I was in a, a two-day Morgan Stanley investor conference just two weeks ago, and we had all of our top investors. They had a lot of our top investors there. Uh, we provided a, an update on on our company and. You know, we're going to have a, a, a real, you know, we're having a real strong year. And we, we're, we're ultimately, you know, getting prepared to, to kind of lay out what 2009 looks like. And so the investors, you know, coming back and saying, you know, what are you guys seeing? This, this thing is getting worse. You know, commodities now are coming down. You know, the, the, uh, that's had, has Im had huge implications for the non-residential construction, which is a big end market for us as well as now the financial and the liquidity within the financial markets being the way they are, you know, this thing is going to, you know, really get tough. And we assured that at the end of the day, our businesses have actually held up pretty well. Our end markets are doing fairly well. And when you look at our overall business performance within Tyco year to date, has been, you know, extremely well. And I think when we look at the financial markets now, is we're in great shape from a balance sheet standpoint. You know, we're in continue to run our business. The question's going to be is without the, without the capital, without the liquidity within, within the, these end markets, you know, what is going to happen? Because companies and, and customers, you know, they, they need funds, they need money to be able to continue to, to run their businesses. And you're seeing that now every day uh, with the lack of, of funds within the market. And so I think it's going to, you know, you, you probably all have been watching it the last couple of days, but, you know, we're going to have, something has to get done because there is definitely a tightness uh, within the market and, and what that means and how that's going to impact the, the end customers that we serve right now, it's hard to predict. But as far as what we're doing, you know, we're in great shape. We continue down the path we're on. We've done a great job um, with our balance sheet. We, you know, we, we're, we're very well positioned, uh, probably better than most. And I think our, you know, the challenge is going to be what's going to happen to the others and then what impact does that have in the markets that we serve, right? So short term, how do we, you know, the, the, the one thing you learn in business is you always put together an operating plan that you believe, obviously, good execution, you know, good leadership you're going to be able to deliver on. But you always find a way to build in contingency. The question is, you know, how much contingency is needed given what the impact might be with these markets, you know, the, the impact of these markets going forward. So I think that's the, the discussion right now. And I, I can't predict, you know, you probably all are as smart as I am relative to what might be happening here and how that might impact, you know, the markets that we compete in. But I, I can tell you right now there's definitely concern, you know, and, and you, you see some of the daily activity going on. But like I said, you know, we feel great about our position. The question is going to be what happens around us that we have to adapt, adapt to. First of all, I'd just like to thank you for coming today. Um, I actually don't have much of a business uh, background in business, but healthcare and science, um, so I can learn a lot from what you say. Um, I'd just like to ask you about being a motivator. To be a leader, it's important to motivate people, and um, could you talk a little bit about how you personally motivate other people and sell your ideas to people within the company and um, outside the company? Okay, I'll, you know, it's, um, I came up, it's interesting because it, it, I, I probably have evolved over time. I came up, I had the luxury of coming up pretty rapidly w under the, the Jack Welsh era of leadership. And um, it was very engaging, very tough, but one that if you were self-confident, if you had depth, if you had self-confidence, if you knew how to drive change and you followed your conviction, you, you could be highly successful with what you did. And with that, you know, maybe it was, a, it was you know, it was, it was kind of a very challenging, very, in, you know, interactive type forum. And I think as time goes on, it, it's, it, it's, you know, and I think the generations also change, right? You've got to change with that. And so it's interesting because especially as you, as you become more global. So what my personally, I like to engage people. I think one of the things, the most important learning for me was I, I worked for great people I had great people that would, would challenge, would, you could interact with, you could, you could question, you could push back, and you could learn. And so I, I, I look at myself saying, how do I create that same experience 
you know, for everyone that, that ultimately works for me or works within my business. So you try to, within, you know, we were talking earlier today, it's kind of a big element of what you do as a leader of a business is time management. And so you're constantly fighting for time. And you're constantly fighting to prioritize time. So time spent on, you know, pure operations, time spent on new business, out in the industry looking at potential deals, time spent with customers, and all too many times you forget the most important element of what you do is time spent with employees, right? And I think so what we try to do is create forums so not only on an individual basis but even during the business process. I find that the interaction during operating reviews, during strategic reviews, um, creates as much learning for individuals as one-on-ones. Now, one-on-ones are important because it allows you to provide perspective and, and share and, and, and collaborate a little bit with the individual, but making sure that you create a, an experience that people can learn from, I think, is most important. So we try to do that in the business processes that we have and how we run our companies. Um, and I think the other element is the whole global perspective. I, you know, challenge myself and stepped up to, you know, we're really going through a major change in the mix of leadership, um, especially as it relates to diversity, both gender as well as uh, global diversity, cultural diversity. And I have stepped up, and I'm championing that for the company. And for me personally, it's been, a, a, in spite of all of the learning that I've had uh, through the experiences I've had, it's been eye-opening to me what is happening um, in business as it relates to people and the composition of what's going to you know, define success going forward. So when you look at, you know, when you look at the mix and in, in what we need to be doing to be a, a real position, you know, real well globally, we're setting out on that agenda. And I find that it, it's not about the numbers. It's about what we're finding. It's purely about inclusion. And so no matter, you know, where you are in the world, gender, uh, race, whatever it may be, is creating an environment such that you become the buzz, right? You become the buzz in the industry of the company that people want to go work for. And it's because you value people, you create an inclusive environment, no matter where people come from, what their backgrounds are, they have every opportunity to be successful. It's being respectful with how we, we do business and how we work with one another. And so we have made huge strides uh, over the last couple of years, and, and it's been fun leading. Um, and and I, I'll tell you that the most important element of any type of change, whether it be culture or environment, is getting your best leaders that are out around your businesses engaged in the, in the initiative. So what I was able to do across all of the, the, the segments, I went to my peers and said, I want all of the, your best frontline operating business leaders that are going to be with me and how we're going to lead this cultural change. And when you get the best people that aren't doing it as a separate initiative or as a staffer, it ultimately now has created, you know, changed the fabric of the company. And at the end of the day, we're going to be more attractive to people that are looking for excitement, are looking for growth, and are looking to, to ultimately develop within the, the type of fields that we're in. And, and it's beginning to work. And so I think, you know, personally, it, it is about people. It's about interaction. It's about learning um, and creating those experiences for people that are now, you know, developing their careers, uh, developing their, their, their depth. And I think that's sometimes we forget. You know, like I'm at a headquarters function now and overseeing a number of businesses, which is a little bit different than what I've had in the past, where in the past I've been directly involved at a business that, that, that ultimately has a lot of people. And so for me, you lose perspective of who you are, the impact that you have relative to the employees that are out there. And so you constantly have to fight to get time to get out and get perspective and, and, and interact with those employees because it helps them and it ultimately helps, helps us in how we, we lead the businesses going forward. Do we have any more questions? Uh, I'd like to add just one last question to close this out then. Uh, a number of our students here will either be looking for internships or for job opportunities here, the graduating students. Uh, any advice to them as they're starting this search and what should be some of the things they should be doing here in the next couple of months? 
You know, we get asked that question a lot, and uh, I'll share my perspective. We're always hiring, right? At the end of the day, it gets back to you're always looking for the best talent. And the whole inclusion agenda that I was talking about was making sure that we're positioned to get the best talent. And so we're always taught, or I was always taught, that no matter what cycle you're in, there's always an opportunity to, to get the best. And so on, on that note, what we're trying to do is, is as, a, as a company, funnel our, our efforts and really focus on where we believe um, the next generation of talent is and where we believe we can be successful in getting that talent into our company, create growth opportunity where they can achieve what they set out to do and then the company will be better off as a result of their contribution. And so that, that experience includes internships. We're constantly looking to get people early in their learning experience. Um, and, and that goes back, you know, in the, in the first stages of university to come into the company as interns uh, because that gives them, it, it's, a, it's a mutual experience where they get a better look at the type of company we are, our values, and if this is a place that they want to work. And we also get an assessment of them to say, is this a, a person or a leader that we think is going to be able to come in and contribute and be successful within, within our environment? And so we're big on expanding the, the internship opportunities because we think at the end of the day that does lead to a better, longer-term experience with the individuals. Uh, we're, always, we're always hiring and looking to upgrade. I think our success um, in, in Tyco has been, it's, it's been both looking at the entry level, getting a much better uh, position within, within the universities to get the best talent out of the, at the entry level, as well as we're looking to upgrade a, a lot of our senior level positions, which we have been doing, and getting you know, talent from the external markets. And so I think, you know, I always tell people, don't, don't get down you know, especially you know, coming out of a university like Notre Dame uh, and the experience that you get here through the learning process. Um, you know, markets go up and down. You know, there's going to be boom times. There's going to be times that may be a tough. But at the end of the day, there's never an opportunity for good people, for good, good talent leadership that ultimately can make a difference. And that's our jobs. I mean, our, I've been taught that the most important job we do as business leaders is, is, is attract the best, develop the best, and, and the, the biggest high you, you, you get as a business leader, and, and it's fun to watch, is the people that you've been able to bring in, you've been able to stretch, and every time you stretch them, they've outperformed, and then they're ultimately at the same level that, that you're at, right, within the business. That's the ultimate high, right, is the give back from the experience that you've had during your career to be able to really position other people in a similar way is a big high. And I think for me personally, we love to get talent in. We love to give every opportunity for that talent to develop. And we ultimately look to, for that talent to be able to position themselves to lead these businesses going forward. And we're having a lot of success and a lot of fun. And, and at the end of the day, I think that's the, other, the last message I'd, I'd, I'd give you. When you're not having fun, at the end of the day, business is fun. And, you know, it was always simply put uh, from, you know, one of my mentors, Jack Welsh, was, it's, it's, it's a sport, right? And, it, and it's, a, if you, it's a game, and you've you got to win. And there's, and, and there's elements of the game. It's, it's how you field your team. It's the game plan. It's the strategy. And then all, part of that is the ability to adjust. So you always want to say, well, that play didn't work. Let's, re, you know, let's adjust and play, you know, play another play. So it, it's the thought that business can be fun, and you play to win, and when you're winning, there's nothing like it. When you're losing and you're not having fun, it's tough, right? And I, I think my, my message to you, search out you know, winning teams, search out winning leaders, be part of that, be your best, make a difference. If you're making a difference having fun, you, you won't believe what you can accomplish. And I think myself personally would never have dreamed to have had the experience that I've had within business. And a lot of it was because when I went on the field, I played a win. I played, a, I played a win, make a difference, and at the end of the day, go home feeling like I did. And if you play like that, you have unbelievable potential ahead of you. And there's plenty of opportunities across business within these type of companies to have that, that opportunity. Okay, thank you very much, George. Great. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
George is going to uh, stay with us for the game tomorrow, so we wanted to make sure that he's appropriately dressed. He didn't yeah. graduate from Notre Dame, but he is a Notre Dame fan. I said his son uh, now goes here, so he's part of our family, and we'll be welcoming back in the future. Thank you Great. again. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Okay, make sure you turn in your blue cards. And also remember, two weeks from now will be the next guest speaker. Thank you very much. And seven people are going to lunch. Please come forward.